Hello, I'm Father Mitch Packwell. Welcome to EWTN Live. We bring you guests from all around the world. Our guest tonight is a little bit different. He's not from all around the world, and he is certainly no stranger to EWTN family. In fact, years ago, after Mother Angelica had her first stroke, he was a rotating co-host of this very show, EWTN Live. But even long before that, he was showing Catholic and non-Catholic EWTN viewers through his powerful one-on-one -on -one interviews that it is possible, no matter how hard the journey, to come home to the Catholic faith, or in the case of many people, to come back home to the Catholic Church if they had left. So for 25 years, he was the host of EWTN's really important and successful series, The Journey Home. Until recently, he passed that torch on to his son, John Mark. However, he remains the president and founder of the Coming Home Network International, which seeks to help non-Catholic Christians, both clergy and laity, to discover the truth and beauty of the Catholic Church. His newest book is called Guideposts for the Journey Home, Conversion Stories with Marcus Grodi. So please welcome a good friend of mine and a great friend of the whole networks, Mr. Marcus Grodi. Marcus, welcome. Thank you, Father. Good to have you back here in Alabama. Thank you for the welcoming introduction. I yeah, appreciate that absolutely. very much. It has been a few years. It has <laughs> been. It has been. And I forgot for a second that I helped. I actually filled in for Mother for a while there. Oh, she yeah. Was going through a tough time. Yeah. Exactly. I, you know, I can recall those days. And then when I first arrived here full time, you were coming to do the... Uh, journey home program as and sometimes a couple other things as well so you're pretty busy in those days yeah well, plus raising a family because well, your, your was boys that. were still young and uh and making sure somebody was there to milk a cow when i was here for a day or two yes and, uh, exactly exactly <laughs> well, that's the past we don't do that anymore you don't have any more cows to milk no we've we whittled the livestock down to four cats so well, and they're hard to herd anyway so but and milk yeah. <laughs> I haven't tried. The scratch marks wouldn't be worth it. <laughs> uh, that's good. Well, it's good to have you back. Yeah. Um, one of the things that, you know, got us to want to have you here is uh, twofold. One, you've got yeah. this book, Guidepost for the Journey Home. Right. Um, and in there, it's some of the interviews, we'll talk about that, but also that now that you've done 25 years mm -hmm. of the program, that you've handed it on to John Mark. Right. How was that, you know, <laughs> passing that over to your son? It, um, by the grace of God, it was extremely good. Yeah. And uh, uh, I think one of the beauties, and I'm pretty sure the audience, if they've watched the, the show with John Mark, will recognize that uh, he's not just doing it only because he's an heir apparent mm -hmm. in his own strength. He does a wonderful job. And I think because of his uh, master's in philosophy background and his own particular journey, he brings a special side to the program mm -hmm. that I think particularly is uh, addressing maybe a younger audience. Uh, mm -hmm. But he does a great job. Yeah. Well, of course, I've also passed the baton of leadership of the Coming Home Network on to him also. Oh, is that uh, right? That's okay. right. And uh, the focus is the same, but they're in many ways using more of the media mm -hmm. to reach that generation whose whole life is the media. So how do you bring them not just to Jesus Christ, but to the church? So, yeah. yeah. Well, see, that, and that's one of the things, too. You and I are just about the same age. I'm yep. just a little older. And neither of us grew up with the kind of media. I mean, we, we're glad to have a color TV eventually. You know, now the, the media is something that is part of warp and woof of the young people's way of thought. And, you know, I think some of that eludes yeah. me still. I don't know about when you. When you and I were young, if we left our home, we were no longer in contact with anyone. 
we didn't have cell phones. We had to go out and find a pay phone if we wanted to get, but, right. but we were truly out of connection. Now it's hard to get disconnected from anyone because of both yeah. the cell phone and the internet and, and that uh, obviously uh, poses new challenges that when you and I were young, we never even imagined yeah. uh, would be there. So, you know, on the one hand, we can, uh, we can focus on the negative aspects of the digital world or like Mother Angelica, recognize this is a gift of God. How do we use it exactly. to proclaim the gospel? Yeah. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I just, you reminded me, you know, I was thinking of the old Dick Tracy comic book when he had a watch that had a television telephone on it. Seemed so impossible, but here we are. There we, there That's we exactly are. what we've got. Now, w let's take a look at some of this book, because what this does is take a look at some uh, important interviews. You've done, uh, I don't know about you, but... I would find it extremely difficult to say which is my favorite oh, well. <laughs> of the interviews. I, I, I don't think I could do it. No, over the years, uh, when I would travel and, and talk and people would always ask me, what's your favorite guest or the favorite program? And you can't do it. Uh, in some sense, I, I've never really had one because I've recognized, as I'm sure you do with mm -hmm. your interviews, that. God speaks through different episodes, different people, for different people, different. Exactly. He never can connect exactly. the two. I, I've often said that I, I do remember a time back when we did the program live. I had just filmed the journey home right here where we're sitting, though it was a different set. And after the program, I was walking back to the house where I used to live in the same house with you for a while. And I remember thinking that that particular episode just didn't go as well as we hoped. And I was, in my mind, I, I thought, oh, boy, you know, uh, oh, you know, the, the temptation is, was that the worst episode, whatever, whatever it was. I went to bed. The next morning I woke up, checked my email. Wouldn't you know it? The first email was, that was the best journey home so far. You just never know. You, don't, you, you don't, never know how you something, don't. and so you, you touch that. So when they first proposed the book, the original title was going to be the best of the journey home. I said, no, I can't, I can't go there. Uh, uh, so, but the idea, as they chose the guests, then the idea caught, well, let's just call it guideposts for the journey home. And what they've chosen are uh, what we would call unique episodes of the journey home because the regular journey home program in the old days was the first half hour was a conversion story and then phone calls and emails when it was live. Mm -hmm. uh, but then we wanted to bring some of the old guests back to answer more phone calls and emails from the audience because that was the goal for it to be as live. So mm -hmm. these are shortened conversion stories, but then they enable the guest to answer the calls that came in. And you know, Father, as I read that book again, I can say this is a great book. And one of the reasons I can say this is because I had nothing to do with it. <laughs> I didn't, I just helped the people tell their stories. Someone here in EWTN chose the different stories, there's uh, one from good old Father Grishel, there's two from Mother Angelica, there's th three or four episodes from Dr. Scott Hahn, there's one from Stephen Mosier, and then one from Alice Von Hildebrand. And what I find fascinating, and Father, I, I know you see this not just with yourself, but your interviews, that we bring these people in, like Scott or Mother Angelica, and they come with great study and scholarship and They've learned so much, but then when they sit here and they have to answer a question and try to bring it down, bring all that into a summarized way to answer a simple question so that someone home, at home can understand, they end up bringing some of their most profound ideas down to a level that they can explain. And that's what this book is all about. Yeah. Like if you want to understand Scott Hahn's view of the covenant and the Father and the Lord's Supper, I mean the, uh, the Lamb's Supper, it's simplified, it's in there. Mother's uh, understanding of her own journey as an aspect of the three ways of the spiritual life. Mm -hmm. She talks about that in there. Or Stephen Mosier's talking about the profound population myth. You know, that whole idea of the, uh, of, um, uh, the, you know, the population explosion, the myth of that and how it affected the one birth policy in China and how that has affected now the sexual revolution that we're still seeing in our country. Yeah. He shares that a little bit in his testimony. Yeah. Well, I'd like to get 
one of the clips because oh, sure. the, these are based on shows it's that a, you did. The, the transcripts and, of the program. Yeah, yeah. And, but here's what it was like with Father Benedict Groeschel, good friend of both oh, of us from back in 2007. Come, Father Groeschel. It's great to have you here. Finally. Finally. We get here. Took me a long time to make the journey well, home. Well, I know. It's, uh, we've done the program about 10 years, and uh, I've said this, I think, on my program, but uh, just to make sure I reiterate it, you were the first person I ever saw on EWTN. My Back God. when I was a Presbyterian pastor, I flipped through the channels and hit this Catholic network. I had no interest in watching it, but I saw this monk. And in Presbyterianism, you aren't used to seeing monks. And there you were with your gray habit and your beard, and I, I almost listened out of humor. What's this monk going to have to say? And then I found out, wait a second, what is he doing preaching the gospel? <laughs> I wasn't expecting that, and I've been a fan of yours forever since then. You are a great witness. And having you on the Journey Home program is not just because you happen to be here at EWTN this week, but because I know that our viewers have been touched by your programs and your books, and I know that conversions by God, you know, the mercy that were used in the lives of others. I know they've been touched by your witness, but I, my bet is that they didn't expect that I was going to have you on my program to talk about your own conversion. Well, listen, let me tell you, I'm working on it. When people say to me, uh, uh, hello, Father, pray for me. I say, well, pray for me for my conversion. <laughs> and they start laughing. Why are they laughing? <laughs> I'm working on my conversion. Yeah, I, this is, you know, hearing him again, you know, just I, brings back, uh, he was such a New Jersey wise guy, and just to the core of who he was. And, you know, just, he was the funniest guy that you could get. I, I thought of him as Bugs Bunny in, <laughs> in a Franciscan Capuchin habit. I, uh, one of my regrets about my time here at EWTN is that of all the times I'd run, a, had the great opportunity to run across some of these people that I didn't spend enough time <laughs> with Father Grishel when he was here. I'd have lunch with Father Dubay when he was here. And, and I look back, why didn't I cherish those moments? This particular clip was after the accident. You know, this was after all of that. So yeah. it was great to make sure we had him back. The one thing. And, and by accident, you're referring to a car accident yes. where a car was speeding uh, at an airport and took a right turn as he was crossing a, a street and hit him. And he, he nearly died. They had yeah. lost him. You know, his pulse was gone. Yeah. And they just kept telling, you know, the friar that was with him said, try it again, try it again, you know, but he came back, but he, he had a lot in, of difficulties. In the interview later, he'll talk about that experience where he, he couldn't move anything. He, he, right. he was laying there. All he could do is just pray the rosary. And he just, that's all I could do. And hey, that's a pretty good thing to do when you're, when you're laying here. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, there's the journeys. So yeah. God bless him. We, we have another clip from that same episode, I'd like to show this, where he talks about the, the mysteries of the faith. Our Lord Jesus Christ was truly a man. He experienced things truly as a man and truly as a God. Do you understand that? Well, no, you don't understand it. Nobody <laughs> understands. Completely impossible to understand. So, What's your point out a, a, a problem that's existed throughout history of the church, and that is that often we find truths that are difficult to put together, and maybe a, a, a characteriz characterization of it is that often as Catholics, we seem to be much more comfortable with the both and, whereas our Protestant brothers and sisters get caught up in the either or. Yes. It has been said to be a Catholic, you've got to be able to chew gum and walk at the same time. <laughs> uh, you have to live with one God and three persons, with one Christ and two natures, with human freedom and original sin. Uh, we have a lot of things like that. And those things are called mysteries. And he, <laughs> he understood that. I think, as a matter of fact, one of my theories is that it's people of faith who are capable of being funny. Oh. The atheists aren't. Because <laughs> God gives you 
enough perspective on yourself. And Father Gershel was so humble yeah. and knew how great God was. And he had perspective on his own foibles and certainly on the foibles of the people around him. You know, he's, he just he said, you know, if you live in New York, you can't help but believe that there's a hell and certainly at least a purgatory. You know, you know? another big part of Father that I'm not sure everyone appreciated was his training in psychology had yes. such an influence Absolutely. on his theology and the way he also approached people to help yeah, them yeah. Uh, deal with their uh, spiritual Absolutely. challenges. Absolutely. Yep. Absolutely. You know, that was, that was also uh, uh, very much a truth. And, you know, he worked in a mental hospital uh, in New York. He was an intern as a psychologist and had great depth of understanding Especially for priests. Yes. He had that special house to he help did. priests. You know, he really he was did. Wonderful man. You know, yeah. I miss him a lot. So. But this um, is, you know, one of the characters, but, you know, <laughs> he's not the only character who's sort of gone through this place. And one of them, of course, is the one who got it all started. You know, you, you have interviews here with Mother Angelica. Yeah. You know, uh, you did the journey home at her inspiration. Right. We, first of all, um, after having the chance to be on Johnette Bankovitz's program to talk about the Coming Home Network, uh, it was then that the uh, producer for Mother's Show happened to the air and said, you know, we want you on Mother's Show. So we were scheduled to be on Mother's Show in December. Oh, boy, that would have been about 90, whatever year, 96, I think. But um, to just talk about the work of the Coming Home Network. But in doing that, Dr. Kenneth Howe was with me, and we talked about our journeys. And it was during that program, as if after hearing our journeys as convert clergy to the church, that's when she said, you know, I'm going to, I want you to have you back. And I thought she meant on her program. But then I discovered later, no, she wanted this right. program. And she, her explanation was that she would so often receive emails, letters from Catholic viewers who were discouraged and they would see their children leaving the faith and how do you get them back? And her view is that if they could hear the conversion stories of non-Catholics coming home, it would give them hope that yeah. if these people can come in, maybe my son and daughter can come back. Let's take a look at a clip from one of those programs where she's talking about the variety of charisms that are in the church. I can believe that Jesus is in the Eucharist. I can believe in the Immaculate Conception. I can believe that baptism takes away original sin. But if it doesn't affect my life by a deep spirituality, and that means I have to apply the sacraments that pertain to me, and it's a part of my life. It just cannot be like the constitutions in, yeah. in, in the government. You, you look at it when it applies to you or somebody questions it applies to you. Otherwise, it's up on a shelf It's somewhere. up on a shelf, yeah. you see. That can happen with sacraments. That can happen with all the beautiful, beauty in the church. And it all happens because the average person is not taught even one of the multitude of kinds of spiritualities. For example, I'm Franciscan, and my particular thrust is that I love Jesus. Do you love Jesus? <laughs> Why don't you love Jesus? You see? Now, if I was Dominican, I would come up with a, that faith is an intellectual ascent to truth. Mm. Thomas Aquinas, wonderful. Yeah. And if I were a teacher, I belonged to a teaching order, like the Visitandines or, or Mother Cabrini, I would be looking with great earnest for souls. Who can I, who can I help? Who can I, who can I talk to in my Jesus? What, what can I do? And you see, that's what's missing. And it's a big hole. Huh. You know, you, t oh, you touched an interesting thing for me because when, when I became Catholic, I envision that I was entering this monolithic united body. Come through this gate and there yeah. it would be. And then what I found is this, on the one hand, amazing, but at times troubling diversity. Yeah. Yeah. And actually all these spiritualities can be paralyzing. Oh, yeah. Which one do I go? And I actually yeah. think that what you've just said helps us 
helps the audience understand the beauty of EWTN because yeah. it, it keyed in on your spirituality. It, That's why we different. focus on Jesus. Right. The focus of, of this network is just not intellectualism. It is Jesus. Yeah. In, you know, it, it was interesting that, you know, Mother had that inspiration while interviewing you. You know, this is something that, uh, as we both know, she spent hours a day praying. You know, this she would take lots of time. She told me once that for every hour she'd be on TV, she needed at least two hours before the Blessed Sacrament. Mm -hmm. And this was something that, you know, she um, very much, you know, uh, had as the source of these inspirations that came to her. And because, uh, you know, it was, it was similar to me. I was on her live show, yeah. and in the middle of it, she said, I want you to come back and do a series. You know, it's, it's that, that kind of yeah. thing, but she would get a, something uh, of a vision yeah. of what she could see. Ah, our Lord wants to get this done, and she would run with it at, right there at the moment. You know, uh, one thing I found, and uh, you probably too in your interviews, is that often when I'll have a guest, and I can tell the first 15 or 16 seconds, they're nervous. Mm -hmm. But once we get going, they're home. Yeah. And we have this great. When I did that interview with Mother, it began the other way around. Because I began 15 seconds nervous. I'm interviewing Mother Angelica. In fact, from what I had heard, that was the first time she herself had been interviewed in that kind of a thing. Yeah. But after the first 15 seconds, it was friendship. Exactly. And I remember, remember how she would, how she would end her, her introduction to her program. What did she always say? We're going to talk about Jesus. Exactly. You know, that was the core. And I think that's why there were so many non-Catholics that would watch Mother. Yep. Because the, right off of the bat, it's about Jesus. Exactly. It's just about Jesus. Exactly. And of course, there she's telling people, hey, it's not enough to just go to Mass every week and do the sacraments and like a... Like you're on a, a treadmill, you've got to understand that in the midst of it is is the the intimacy, in the indwelling of our Lord Jesus Christ, and exactly. that was her emphasis. And you know, this was something that uh, not only inspired her to have you on her show, but then to have the show that you did, the interview with her, and it affected people. She could see that the gift that you had, uh, you know, I, I was, we were talking earlier in the day and I said that you remind me of Arthur Godfrey. You're just, <laughs> but you're just a little bit younger, but he was one of these, he was one of the early interview hosts, you know, back in the early fifties. And I, he spoke over my head. I was just a little boy, but you could tell that he was uh, uh, very easygoing, you know, uh, had a nice, low-key pleasantness about him that you've brought to so many people to help evoke from them their stories. Yeah. And you've supported them in that, and, you know, enjo you've enjo obviously enjoyed doing all those stories over these years. Well, I... Uh, one thing the audience may not know, and, and again, I don't know if this is how you do yours, Father, but I know when I sat down with one of those guests, uh, I'd know their name and what denomination they used to be, but that would all be about it. Mm -hmm. I was learning their story at the same time the audience was. Mm -hmm. And to me, that helped me have the same reaction to what they're saying is the audience would have. I'd make sure if there's any red flags, I would know those ahead of time. Yeah. But, but on the other hand, it allowed me to do that because we're, when you and I interview, we're not just thinking ourselves, we're also thinking, well, what is that audience? What was their question they would like to ask that yes, person? Yes, exactly. You exactly. Know, and, 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 that's a and you know, this was something that I found very helpful uh, as well. I, I, I would tell my guests, you know, they would start telling me more about this. I said, I just want to know where you want to start, <laughs> but um, I want us just to, to talk. We don't, you know, pre-script our interviews. No. That would be boring. I remember uh, one time when they forgot to turn the monitor on, and the only thing I needed the monitor on was the name of my guest. 
yeah. you know, and maybe what they were. And if they didn't turn it on, and I tell you, I didn't remember my guest name. And it was live program when we're starting. Good evening, it's the journey home. And, and I can't remember my guest sitting there. And I'm talking around it and kind of getting there. And my guest said, you forgot my name <laughs> on the live program. <laughs> and I said, I did. And then we laughed about it and got on. But, uh, you know, that's all we had as a, man as a transcript was just the name. Yeah. and where they came from. Yeah. Well, one of the names that wasn't <laughs> just a name, but someone that you knew and had respected oh, yeah. from the days you were in the Presbyterian Seminary with him was Scott Hahn. Yeah. And you knew him to be a, a, a man of great integrity. You Intensity. Know, back, yeah. He, he at, at seminary, wasn't a Presbyterian, was an evangelical non-denominational oh. seminary, but, but the point was he was the most vehement Catholic, or Calvinist that I'd ever met. He was, uh, uh, and he would, as an evangelist for Calvinism at our non-denominational event. So he was very committed to Calvinism. But a part of that was his commitment to the understanding of covenant. Right. And covenant. So that predated a, yeah. his Catholicism. But that was also what set him up for Catholicism. Mm -hmm. So I've known him on the way back. So then in later, after we had graduated and went on to our ministries, I had heard through the grapevine that he had become Catholic. Of course, I thought it was a lie or, you know, that's crazy. How could, Scott Hahn, there's no way he would ever consider the Catholic Church. And then for a while there, I thought, well, maybe he's clandestinely snuck into the church to try and pull people out of it. That would make more sense <laughs> than him becoming Catholic. But then we met again, and uh, once I heard his story, that was what the Lord used to open the door for me to start considering the church. Yeah, we'll, we'll get back to that in a minute. Let's, let's take a look at a clip of Scott talking about conversion How to about Catholicism. <laughs> and I look back on my own life because I was converted to Christ through young life in my mid-teens. And then for the next several years, I pursued scripture with this holy fervor. And I would go to Grove City College, I went to Gordon-Conwell Seminary, because as you said, I lined it up and I saw these are the men who are going to make the, the scriptures come alive. And so I had my own Gamaliels. But just as uh, Saul, the Pharisee, who had graduated as a prized pupil under this great, great professor, came to a sudden decisive turning point in his own life in his mid to late 20s, so also I did after graduating top of my class as a, an evangelical Christian with strong anti-Catholic convictions, my love for scripture was always greater than my, my contempt for Catholic ritualism and superstition. And so as I found in the fathers more connections between the old and the new and in their homilies they made the Bible come alive, I kept absorbing more and more, going deeper and deeper and discovering baptism is a lot more than I realized. The Eucharist is more than just symbolism and ritual. And so in my late 20s, you know, with so much coming up Catholic, I made a decision that looked and felt a lot like professional suicide. <laughs> losing a job, yeah. losing family members, friendship, and you know, all kinds of things. But discovering that really the fullness of my faith as an evangelical, Bible-believing Christian was not something that I had to reject, but just take to the next level. Mm -hmm. That there was more good news than I thought maybe 10 or 12 years earlier. And I think of Saul that way too, because we call him a convert, but he didn't convert from one religion to another. He converted from one understanding of Judaism as a Pharisee to a much deeper and higher understanding because he'd always waited for the Messiah, only later did he find out that he had arrived and that he was persecuting him by persecuting his followers. And so for me, I wasn't just non-Catholic, I was anti-Catholic and in a loving sort of way, I tried to target my Catholic friends and help them to see the error of their ways until I discovered the error of my ways, my anti-Catholic ways. And so in 86 at the Easter Vigil in Milwaukee, I was received into the church and uh, it's just been ongoing conversion since then as it was for Paul. Well, in case the audience doesn't know the, the deeper story, uh, Rome Sweet Home came out when? 93. 93. You and Kimberly yeah. wrote, wrote that together. We did in three weeks with a lot of prayer and tears and laughter <laughs> <laughs> and editing each other. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> that was, it was neat heaven Scott on because our history goes back so many years. I've jokingly said he and Kimberly would spend their time studying while I was playing basketball. And there's some truth to that because they, they were deeply committed to finding truth. And uh, in some ways, their real journey came, of course, he was studying covenant and the implications of that through scripture and on into the history of the church. But Kimberly 
had become very convicted on the issue of birth control. And as a Presbyterian became con convicted through her studies uh, that birth control was wrong. And then eventually at some point she f read this document called Humana Vitae and thought this thing's pretty convincing, gave it to Scott and it changed their lives. Yeah, well, yeah. and their family size. That is exactly right. <laughs> and they, they have a, not only a number of children, but a number of grandchildren and You've and got, a priest. Yeah, and, and a priest, <laughs> and you've got the same, yep. you know, yep. children, grandchildren, and, and a priest in, uh, with your right. son. Right. We need to take a little break. Right. We're going to come back in a uh, couple minutes, so please stay with us. We want to get some of your calls and questions and comments, and we'd just love to hear from you. Welcome back. We are with Marcus Grodi discuss, discussing a new book uh, called Guideposts for the Journey Home Conversion Stories with Marcus Grodi. It's uh, available, of course, at EWTNRC.com, our religious catalog, and it is item number 83467. 83467, you get it there. Also, if you want to find out more about the Coming Home Network International, you can go to chnetwork.org, chnetwork.org. Now, before we get to want, some calls. I also want to say thank you for doing that little promo for the Coming Home Network. We really do appreciate that. Oh, yeah. Because absolutely. I can't tell you how many calls we'll get from EWTN viewers who especially are non-Catholics who have to be happen to be watching and they have questions and they want to know now what are they going to do with their lives after they discovered the Catholic Church. Sure, so, sure. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Uh, before we get to calls, uh, we, we were <laughs> chatting a little bit because hearing Scott speak to you reminded me of how you and I had had a conversation just before you became a Catholic as well. Why don't you Yeah, well, this is going to be funny because I might remember it through my sieving years, and you might have to give your side of the story. But <laughs> what I remember is uh, I had gotten to the point where through my studies, listening to, to Scott's testimony and then others, you, we got what we would eventually call no man's land, where you can never go back spiritually right. because of what you've learned. But I'm not ready to go forward because of all the unknowns and the implications about, uh, you know, I've been a Protestant 40 years, all my trainings in ministry, that's all that I know to do at adult age. What am I going to do? And I've got children and, and uh, I wasn't sure. And someone gave me your name. Insurance. Insurance was the thing. That was one of the things you brought up. Like, I got to take care of my family. It, exactly. And... Uh, and in fact, I was looking at coming into the church at age 40. It's hard to start over from scratch at age 40. Mm -hmm. What do you do? And uh, I had an engineering degree, but that was way out of date. So someone gave me your name, and I had seen you on, on EWT, and I'm sure. And so I called you, and we talked a bit. And what I remember is my question to you is, Father, can I become a Catholic and stay a Presbyterian? And you said, well, something like, well, try it or something like that. No, it says, try it if you can. But you, well, I you, know what you, meant, though. You, you understood the implication. Exactly. You won't be able to do it. Yeah, and I can't remember if I called you back not long after that and said. Mm -hmm. About two days later. There's no way because, uh, and the, the funny thing is, there are a lot of especially clergy that get to that point that want to try and do that. In other words, Okay, I've now learned a much fuller understanding of the faith, but I have this pulpit. 
can I remain here in this? And sort of make them more Catholic. Make that them was more Catholic. That was one of the other options. I said, yeah, that wouldn't be good for their conscience. They're expecting you to, in their conscience, preach Presbyterianism. Yeah. So that wouldn't be, I, I suggested that that wouldn't be fair either. But that was one of the, the seeds for the Coming Home Network. Yeah. Because we knew that we were starting to encounter clergy inquirers, men and women who were on the journey, who had trained, ordained Protestant ministers, who had gotten into no man's land. They couldn't go back, but they had a hard time going forward. And so from Methodist, Catholic, I mean, uh, uh, Calvinist, Baptist, Assembly of God, Church of Christ, and they're wondering, what are we going to do now? So the Coming Home Network was formed not to push, pull, or prod them into the church, but to stand beside them and help them. And help them out. In fact, exactly. there, there's almost a sense in which a Protestant on the journey needs to start thinking like a Catholic first because they're trying to discern God's will. Well, to discern God's will, you almost need to think like a Catholic because there's a lot of other ways out there trying to discern God's will that isn't very trustworthy. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you see a truck pass by with a mud shape like the face of Jesus. Well, that must mean God wants me to do something. Eh. So we're slowing men down. And helping them, and that your call was very helpful. Yeah, I, mean, I remember, I remember that back then. well. Let's go to a caller here. We have Steve in Oregon. Steve, what you got for us? Yes, I said before a person was a Catholic. Did God know that eventually he would be a Catholic? You're the Jesuit. All right, <laughs> <laughs> Steve, you got to think a little bit differently. You're thinking inside of time. God doesn't have time. It's not that he knows beforehand. He doesn't. I, I did that to Angelica once. <laughs> Mother was here and a lady asked a similar kind of question. I said, well, of course, God doesn't know the future. Well, Mother Angelica came to the edge. What? And I said, he doesn't know the future because God has no future. It is already present. Yeah. yeah. And that moment of the person converting is not something he knows will happen. You and I think about that because we are caught within time. God in his true eternity is above and beyond time. And he doesn't see what's going to happen. It's already present to him. Now, that's hard for us to comprehend yeah, yeah. because this is something that is at the nature of the divine, uh, of God's being, God's nature. So it's, it's at the core of God's nature that he is timeless. And for us to understand God's timelessness is more difficult than a dog understanding the meaning of the hands on our clocks. <laughs> they can understand that more quickly than we can understand God's timelessness. But it's not something that he knows will happen. For him, that moment is already present. And he's always in that eternal interaction with that person. And that's how we have to learn to think. The reason I wanted you to answer, uh, answer that besides you know, you're uh, a much sharper knife in the drawer than I'll ever be. <laughs> but it, I remember the paper that I did at seminary. So I'm thinking like a Calvinist at seminary in a, in a Calvinist environment. Um, and my paper was, if God is so predestined everything, then why pray? And mm -hmm. I remember that, that conundrum, you know, if he's predestined everything, then why pray? And I look back and realize that I didn't, I did not have a good handle on what you just talked about. Because my answer was, is, is that in the mystery of things, that prayer really existed from the beginning of time kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. you, you're, you, you know, and it reminded me of, again, what Paul in his letters to Timothy warned Timothy at least twice. Listen, don't get in battles over words. Mm -hmm because they'll just lead to divisions. We, and St. Irenaeus and is against heresies warned uh, someone about 
about delving into areas that are beyond our human ability to fully understand. We can talk about just what you said, but in the end, we leave it a mystery. We, we just, we have to, because there, we do not, God hasn't given us the ability to understand what it would mean to live outside of time. That's a soup we've always lived in. Right. We can describe it philosophically, but in reality, or, or like a, Jesus had two wills. <laughs> What a mystery that is. Yeah. It's a reality because we try to describe how to put conundrums together. But at the end of the day, we should be humbled by the mystery of our God. Exactly. Uh, you know, so did God know ahead of time? Uh, the main thing is we want to help that man come in. We leave that other part to God. And and even when we talk about helping somebody come uh, to know Christ and to know his church, you know, I'm, after 48 years of being a priest, I've never converted anybody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's not what I do. Conversion is a management issue, and God is management. My job is to give the reason to believe and I can try to give those reasons with the limits that I, of what I have, uh, my ability. But ultimately, it's the grace of God that works in the person, and he converts a soul. I don't. There, there's an old, I'm sure you can do a Scottish accent better than I can, but there's an old story about a, 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 a traveler passing by this beautiful Scottish garden, just absolutely beautiful. And the person said out loud, boy, look what God can do to this garden. And after, and after they said that, all of a sudden the Scottish gardener pops up and says in his brogue, well, you should have seen this garden when God had it all to himself. <laughs> <laughs> the mystery of God's grace and our freedom. You know, he can give the grace to awaken someone's heart to the fullness, but still that person has, is free to respond. Exactly. It's a both and, and there's the mystery of that both and. Mm -hmm. We don't want to take away from God's sovereignty, but we also don't want to take away from the responsibility that we have to respond to God's grace. Yeah, and that's why we like to talk about it as a personal relationship. Yeah. Yeah. It's a back and forth. Yeah. You know, this is a key element. We have Thomas uh, from Tennessee on there. Thomas, what have you got here going on? I got a question for Marcus Grodi. Uh -uh. I, I actually That's wrote this one down. In, it, here it is. In all of your episodes or interviews, did you find a common thread as to why people converted to Catholicism or came back, reverted to the faith? Yeah, thank you, Thomas, for that. Um, there are some common threads. It is interesting to think, and Father, maybe you have seen this too, that there was a time in the 90s when we thought there was a tsunami of converts. Mm -hmm. And it kind of peaked, actually peaked around the year 2010, if I do my data, and then it's been kind of gradually down. And it kind of followed the same peak of the charismatic renewal and even the Marian stuff. Mm -hmm. And the only reason I bring that up is that what I saw is that different time periods, there are different things that seem to motivate people. One of the main issues is the issue of authority. If you look at scripture, you see the truth, but you also recognize that everywhere you turn, there's another person giving a different interpretation of that scripture. And sometimes, I mean, I remember what struck me as a Presbyterian pastor is I realized that Protestants were not convinced on what is necessary for salvation. So we're talking about the most important thing mm -hmm. and they weren't agreed on that. So we needed an authority so that when you take a difficult passage like our Lord says, unless you deny everything, you can't be my disciple. <laughs> what do you do with that? And think about all the interpretations. So they look for an authority. That was probably the most, a large majority of one phrase of that or another. Um, others were, um, uh, moral questions. You know, how do you answer the big moral issues today like abortion, uh, looking for an authority on that. Uh, but 
you know, the Lord uses, on the other hand, uh, a great variety of grace. I, I remember one guest who had a good journey. It was good. But in the end, he said, you know, I'll tell you why I'm here. It's because after I came in, I then discovered that my mother had been praying the rosary every day for me for the last 35 years. That's why I'm in this church, because of the prayers that came as a result of her grace. Yeah, yeah. And that, again, it's that action of God's grace that inspired his mother to be faithful in prayer, but then the grace of God that stirred within his heart. You know, and our Lord's response to his mother to encourage her, I'm sure, but as well as sending this man the the grace that he needed at the right moment. This is the, this is a set of complex personal relationships with God. Every, every conversion is slightly different, but uh, you would probably agree, Father. I looked at over a thousand interviews I've done on the journey home. The vast, uh, almost unanimously, what was unique and neat to see is that when push comes to shove in the end, it wasn't these guests saying that they were so smart or that they'd read so much. Uh, You know what I'm saying? They humbly recognize. It was God's grace. It was God's grace. Yeah. It was God's mercy. You know, you you speak about how conversions differ one from another. Last week I was uh, talking with... Uh, Dale Alquist about yes. the conversion yes. of Chesterton that took about, he was convinced yeah. of Catholicism for 10 years before he actually joined the church. Yeah. Um, we have a clip here of your interview with uh, Alice von Hildebrand oh, talking yes. about the conversion of her husband Dietrich von Hildebrand. Let's take a look at that. It took six years <laughs> for him to enter the church. He was taken up by his studies. He was a brilliant stu- uh, student of Husserl. Husserl considered him his most talented student. He was engaged. He got married. He had a child. And then all of a sudden, another thing happened, which was going to be decisive. His second sister was married to an American uh, who was living in Rome and had become an Italian citizen. And he hadn't seen her for years. They had very little contact because he was at the university and he was, she was in Italy. And suddenly he finds out She has become a Roman Catholic. And she was a very proud lady, handsome, talented, a remarkable painter. And it was the most, the one of his sister was least religiously inclined. She had said to my husband when he was a little boy, you know, Christ is quite a nice person, but for goodness sake, don't compare him to Michelangelo, to Beethoven. I mean, this is ridiculous. I mean, these are geniuses. You know, he's just a good man. And she found Christ and invited him and his wife to go to Rome and to be there at the presence of him when he received her first communion in the catacombs. Ah, For the first time in his life, he went to Rome. And, you know, this proud lady was kneeling down, begging God for forgiveness for her sins, and he was just overwhelmed. And on the way back, they were going back to the beautiful place in, in the center of Rome, and he said, you know, grace is knocking at your door. If you don't answer immediately, it might not come back. Promise that when you go back to Munich, you're going to take instructions. He went to Munich, started to take instructions, and he knew nothing about Catholicism, and he drank him in like a sponge. You know, he couldn't hear, and of course, all the dogmas, and he had no difficulty. Yeah, the, the, another example of how different twists and turns in people's lives uh, that lead to conversion. And yeah, that story is developed more in your book. You right. give the full interview uh, there. I'd like to go to another call, if you don't mind. We right. have Linda from the great state of New York. Linda, what can we do for you today? Hi, Father. I had a question for your guest. I've watched The Journey Home over the years. And I wondered if anybody ever gave him a hard time, if they either um, had a bad attitude or was trying to be argumentative. It seemed like everybody was pretty um, happy to be there and to share their story. But I wondered if anybody ever surprised him. You know, thank you for that question. Um, uh, We weaned out 
all the really difficult ones and set them to Father Paqua's program so for him, <laughs> him to handle. Uh, it, by God's mercy and grace, I look back over the years, and these were people who, they're still on the journey. Everyone is still on the journey, all right? But they were growing in humility and gratitude for what had happened to them in their life. And being on the Journey Home program uh, was their way of telling a story. Now, the other thing is, is that the way the program was, is it wasn't an apologetic debate. Mm -hmm. You know, I understood my job as a host. I always told my guests, I'm like a box keeper. You know, I start us on time, I end us on time, I keep us on the subject, but, on, but other than that, it's your program. Right. It's the, you know, our job is to exactly. start, stop, keep exactly. them in, and let them talk. You and I can talk forever, but we let them talk. So I didn't encounter that. The other thing that's amazing, though, is, again, by God's grace, in all those years, I can't think of one program that EWTN pulled because somebody was so off the wall. Mm -mm. Yeah. You know, these are people that really had studied the faith and were humble about it. So that was mercy of God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that was uh, that was always a lot of fun. In fact, uh, I was on with you once when you had a convert from Islam, yes. uh, Daniel Ali. Yes. You know, I still have some contact really? with him. Good. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, Daniel did a wonderful job, but you know, I, ha I remember being there with him. He did most of the talking, uh, <laughs> but I did the blessing at the end in yep. Arabic, you know, Christian blessing at the end. Yep. And uh, it, so the, there are these different folks who come sometimes from difficult situations. Yep. He had been a prisoner of Saddam Hussein right. and was tortured by him. Uh, and, you know, had to fight his way out of prison to survive. Um, he had witnessed Saddam Hussein using gas on his village. He was on a hill as a guard, and he saw the bombs with the gas drop and kill his fiance and uh, relatives. So, I mean, we the people come from such great, diverse backgrounds. But they came to Christ, and they were very peaceful. Over the years, certainly, there have been times we've had a guest scheduled, and then at the last minute, the guest decided, you know, I really can't or shouldn't do this for a variety of reasons in sure. their life. Sometimes it's because there are important people in their life that aren't ready to hear the story. Yes. And they don't want to. But the most common guests that did cancel were the former uh, Islamics. Yeah. They got yeah. nervous. Yeah, because the, the, their families were oftentimes felt yeah. threatened. Yeah. And, you know, there was difficult. Yeah. <laughs> Daniel had, <laughs> had a great idea. He said, so if they put a fatwa on me and kill me, this is good. Because for all the sins of my past life, if I die as a martyr, I go straight to heaven, <laughs> no purgatory. <laughs> Secondly... My tribe would be so upset they'd become Christian just to spite them. So he, he, yeah, he was we funny. had funny, funny guests. I, I again want to let people know this. This book is a great book, uh, guidepost for the journey home, conversion stories with Marcus Crodi. You can get it from EWTNRC.com. It's item eight three four six seven. And you can also go find out more about the Coming Home Network International. It's chnetwork.org, chnetwork.org. And we thank you for thank all you these Father. years of having done this. Um, you know, we've, <laughs> we've done this with shows you did with Mother and then the Journey Home, and also for making this available and keeping up the adventure. Yeah. Thank you for being here with us tonight. Well, Father, thank you not only for our friendship, but for all you do for EWTN. I know there are people every week that look forward to hearing you and, and your hosting of your no, guests. So thank you for your witness. Absolutely. A lot of fun. Well, may the Lord bless you and bless all of you as well and keep you and cause his face to shine upon you. May God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And as our mutual 
good friend, mentor, and instigator, Mother Angelica used to say, remember to keep us in between your gas bill, your electric bill, and I always add your cable bill. And if you do that, we'll be able to pay all of our bills too, to keep this network going, especially during Holy Week. You know, as we get ready to celebrate the Easter mysteries from around the world, your support makes it possible. God bless you and thank you all.